Welcome everyone back to this week's Cat's Eye on the Future. It's the month of August when I'm recording this in 2014, or just about to be. We're actually on the 31st of July, but basically moving into August. And most of the people I would normally be interviewing are not surprisingly on vacation and off doing other things like conferences and or just taking time with their families. So for the next week or two, we're probably going to be doing things mostly with me. Last week, I did a show with predictions for the second half of the year, and you can listen to that. It's, it's up there now in the archives. This week, I thought I'd start with another topical show, and this week I thought we'd talk about the unseen world. Now, what is the unseen world? Well, the unseen world is one of many names for the world that's just not experienced by our usual five senses. Most traditional cultures and religions recognize the existence of such a place, though early societies, and a lot of modern ones, don't always view them as separate from the real world. As modern people, we have a real sense of the difference. You know, we have what we think of in the West, especially as reality and fantasy, or perhaps the material and the spiritual might be another way, of, a better way of putting it. To early people, and a lot of traditional peoples, the unseen world's not really a separate place at all. It's just another facet of the same reality they're already inhabiting. That can be kind of hard for most modern people to get their head around, but you need to keep that in mind as we talk about this topic. Now, modern Western thought tends to view the world, again, either as the material realm that you can see, measure, taste, and smell, or perhaps as a layer cake with a nasty underworld below it, an earth in the middle, and heaven somewhere above. A lot of popular religions or even popular beliefs tend to fall into the second category. Both the underworld and whatever overworld we see, like a heaven, are beyond us, at least while we're alive. There's no contact. And they're not expected to play a direct role in our lives. I mean, that is really kind of the default spiritual view of, of many people, especially again in the West. Now, a lot of traditional societies or belief systems view the world as being more connected and less strictly defined. More like a group of circles lying side by side that sort of float about and sometimes they intersect with each other. Or there's a door going sideways instead of straight ahead, whereas we tend to see things more as going either forward upward, backwards, down, there's this sideways idea. This is kind of a vague generalization of the two worldviews, and the reality of all of them is are much more complicated than, you know, than what we're talking about here. Even the huge mainstream religions may have traditions of the unseen and personal experiences that can defy their more orthodox thoughts. For example, St. Francis of Assisi reported having out-of-body experiences that you might more associate with something like Buddhism or some more traditional faiths. And of course, there are individuals in any society, including traditional ones, that may feel a complete separation from the divine and have no interest really in much of anything beyond their material existence. All people are different, and you're going to find individuals like that in any group. But these generalizations that I'm making can sometimes be helpful in sorting out why some things seem to be easy to understand and other concepts may just seem more difficult or outlandish, again, especially for the general Western audience that's most likely to be listening to this show. Most people listening to this show, though, are likely to come from this Western or more rational worldview. Worldview here is something that's defined as the concepts you were exposed to when you were growing up and in your society. They're not necessarily your actual personal opinions that you've developed after careful thought or long experience. That's where sort of thinking it can help a person develop their worldview and lead to a greater understanding of what's around them. But we all pretty much carry around with us the education and the experiences we had in childhood from our parents, extended families, and our friends. So no matter how far we may have walked away from where we started, it's important to understand where we took our first steps because they may still be influencing what's going on, even if we've walked a long way away from where we originally started. 
So returning to this question, what is the unseen world? It is in fact many places or all places. But let's make it simple. Think of the unseen world as that realm which is not material. Parts of it will be what tribal societies think of as the place of the ancestors, perhaps the realm of the dead, which is not exactly the same thing as a western heaven or paradise, but it is similar. Parts will be the land of dreams, or what some societies call the dream time. Other parts may include places where time flows differently from the world we perceive. People can journey there by design or accident. They may be able to view the future or the past while there. And some parts may intersect yet other places. The dimensions of modern physics, perhaps. But many religious systems have tried to diagram some of these realms and aspects of the unseen, and they often call them different worlds, which is very interesting. As with the nine worlds of the native Scandinavian belief, magical systems may call these aspects planes, worlds, or they always seem sort of as a destination, which again is just really interesting when you think about it. There's some fairly universal ways to travel to these places, or even avoid getting to them if you're trying to avoid them. And general principles of what to do if you arrive there, again, by accident or on purpose. Knowing about these techniques is really good information to have, even if you choose not to use any of them. It's useful to know, nevertheless, as some of the traditional means of reaching the unseen world are, such as food deprivation, extreme pain, they can even be gotten there by the side effects of prescription drugs or non-prescription drugs, as the case may be. Again, this that may cause what's called a spontaneous journey, and it's an example of something you may not be intending to take, especially if you're just taking something your doctor gave you for, say, a headache. You probably aren't really trying to reach the other world, but you could end up there anyway. Knowing what is happening can help counteract the fear and can help aid you in getting things sorted out and back to normal if something like this happens. Later in different shows, we may discuss these techniques in greater detail, but with kindly suggestions as to which methods might be better than others to try to intentionally reach such states when you want them. But that's not really the point of this show. In fact, what is the point of this show? I mean, why bother with the unseen world at all? First off, many people lead happy, fulfilling lives without much or any experience with what they would consider the unseen. Most people, if you talk to them in a safe situation, like a train station or a bus ride, well, you'll never see them again. So they're very happy to tell you anything because they know it's not going anywhere. They'll often tell you about a dream they had where their dead grandmother warns them about somebody else that's going to pass in the family, or perhaps feeling like they've been someplace before, that deja vu feeling when visiting a new place. But that's about as far as it goes. If these people happen to be family members or friends and they're happy with their lives the way they are, please don't feel the need to disturb them. They're in the space they need to be in for now, and unless they approach you and ask directly for some information, I just listen and then not push it. This is especially important if you're encountering the unseen world for the first time yourself. As you learn more, you may discover that these same people will start talking to you, asking questions, and then, as I said, it's safe to answer. But pushing people who are happy the way they are is just likely to annoy them. Also, some people in the West have deep personal taboos about exploring the unseen, which may derive from religious concepts formed in early childhood and often reinforced by that large body of popular horror books and movies, which promise too much supernatural reality and gruesome fates for dabblers. Because these can be deep-seated fears and prejudices, they're best left alone until the individual wants to explore them further. For atheists, agnostics, and very religious monotheists who have some difficulty appreciating the validity of other traditions. Chiefly, you're going to find this among the Abrahamic religions, although it can happen anywhere, but that would be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's often easiest to direct people who are still interested in reading about the metaphysical traditions within their own religious context. For example, 
Christians and Catholics might benefit from reading just about anything by Thomas Merton, who is the author of The Seventh Story Mountain. He was a monk uh, in the 20th century. And other monastic writings like St. John on the Cross, which is much earlier, and or even a biography of St. Francis. For people coming from a Jewish background, um, studies of the Kabbalah, Hasidic mysticism, may or may not be appealing to somebody, but it, it's again, it's a direction that they can take. And for, for Muslims, I would look at Sufi religious thought. And for anybody who may be coming from an atheist agnostic background, but who is truly interested in trying to understand things, Buddhism or Jungian psychology is often a good place for them to start or for you to perhaps direct them that they might want to read something. If you have your own religious or metaphysical path already, it's perfectly all right to share your views on it. But if you notice that a person who's come to you for help, especially, is getting deeply uncomfortable when you suggest, say, that the goddess Bast may be able to help heal their sick cat, or that the goddess Hell really is a goddess and not an everlasting torture chamber, and they get uncomfortable, just try to figure out where they're coming from and direct them to a place they can understand. Even though the traditional shaman or, say, a seer has a duty to help the tribe, part of doing it is knowing when to back off and when to jump into the water to help someone who appears to be drowning. Okay, so that's that's people with a, a really set mindset. What about everybody else? Well, well, the minority of modern people who find the unseen world something they want to explore tend to fall into two basic types of people that I've noticed. I call this people who want to look for and find the unseen world and people for whom the unseen world comes looking for them. As you keep listening, you'll probably see yourself pretty quickly in one of these two basic categories. Most folks will have some experiences that fall into, into some of a little bit of both, but the majority of people find themselves really in one category or the other. At least that's been my experience working as a professional psychic off and on and, and a religious person in Osetru and paganism for about 30 years now. Okay, so let's look at the first type of person. This is the person who goes looking for the unseen. And this might even be the same type of person that had come to you asking for help, but was having a little trouble with some of the information. So you've directed them off to read about Buddhism or Sufism or whatever, and they come back and they're, 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 they're more interested. They want to hear more. But it can also be just, just per anybody in general who is just maybe they've read some books and maybe they've watched a few movies and they, they want to know more about it. Some people, a lot of people come into this from science fiction and fantasy. You know, they, they want to know like, okay, well, we know that some of this is fiction, but what if any of this is real? Can I, can I look for it? And in general, people who look for the unseen world are those who believe or would like to believe it exists, you know, and they want to just know more about it. They've, they've read the books. They've talked about it to other people. They, maybe even watched other people have experienced it in real life. But they themselves find it meditations like taking a good nap. It's, they fall asleep. The future is a closed book. Ghosts are good things to tell stories about around a campfire if they've never seen one or experienced one. And, and their dreams tend to be about, you know, having dinner the next day. They may have had one or two experiences they can't explain, but that just like sort of whets their appetite for more. They may even be confirmed, have been confirmed skeptics before something happened to them or to someone they love that they, they, they can't discount. They know the person isn't lying and they want an explanation. And they're determined to get to the bottom of it. You see this a lot, in, in, as a side note, in people who maybe have seen a UFO or had an experience of a dream that came true or something. And they, they just, they can't, they can't, but they can't place it in their own reality. But after a few months of searching, they've come to believe themselves a psychic is a doorstop, the place where things stop and nothing ever seems to happen to them, even if it seems to happen to other people. Or perhaps this one thing or two things have happened, but nothing's likely to ever happen again, at least not that they can control or instigate. Take heart if you recognize yourself or parts of yourself in this description. People who start out this way often become some of the best practitioners of whatever magical, religious, or medical, physical tradition 
they decide to pursue. Why? Because they don't feel things. They're often very intelligent and they use their heads. They think about things. Even if they never develop obvious psi talents to dazzle their friends with, they can be rocks of stability for those who are more prone to fly off into the astral. In Wiccan or ritual magical circles, they're often chosen for the frequently underrated role of guardian, which done properly is a lot more than just answering the telephone or explaining to the local cops what the funny people in funny clothes are doing in the park at 10 p.m. Their role is to guard against everything. And a warrior or a guardian doesn't always have to see the enemy to know that they're there. What he or she does is to do to, to protect those who are vulnerable as well as themselves. This is hardly a role for wimps or the uninitiated extra husband who drove their partner to the circle that night which in my experience too is often done and is really not a good idea, but that's a topic for another show. People with this basically more skeptical outlook do well by putting their native intelligence and that skepticism to good use. Read, watch, and learn as much as you can. And don't worry about feeling anything. If you are drawn to it, explore some of the more intellectual types of tradition. Look into rune lore if you're, you know, a heathen or into Norse things. Aspects of ritual magic if you're a witch. Or Buddhist meditation techniques or remote viewing if you're an exploring agnostic. Regular practice picked with care after allowing a period of exploration to find what seems right for you, when it's done with discipline, can bring some really surprising results. You may even find yourself suddenly thrust into the next category of person when the unseen, might just come looking for you. Now, this second type of person can be the stereotype of what people think of when they think of as a cult or metaphysical people. In extreme cases, like myself, this could be an individual who as a child talks to angels or unseen friends, sees pretty rainbows around other people, and talks freely about, when I was big the last time, much to the terror confusion, or even amusement of their parents who can think this is anything from, oh my god, my child may be going to hell, to, well, isn't that a funny thing that Bobby said? Growing up untrained, as most Western people do, although books like Harry Potter and other things like that may be helping to change this for the next generation, people like this, particularly as children, often have a dormant period around puberty. Although more rarely they may exhibit what's something called poltergeist activity or other very strong uh, forms of psychic phenomenon around puberty, this is more rare. So it's very rare to have a child with physical objects moving around them that shatter their own accord or other things going on, but it can happen. More often, I've, I've seen this period of physical, of, excuse me, of psychic dormancy where things just sort of seem to shut down. And many experts that work in this field think there's a link between sexuality and various forms of psychic development. So going either going dormant or exploding can be accompaniments to those storms of adolescence when the body is changing and all of these things are going on. I'm not saying that, you know, obviously that's not an established fact of any sort, because uh, these aren't things that you can, you know, demonstrate in a, necessarily in a lab, but they're certainly believed by many people who have experience in the field. Sometime around traditional adulthood, which was really around 15 or 16, not the 18 to 21 we see today, the unseen usually returns and it may come back in a variety of ways. And if there has been poltergeist or other extreme activity, it tends to slow down or stop. So either you get a return to things starting to come back or if really weird stuff has been happening, it tends to go away usually. What happens next often depends on the set of variables of the family itself. You know, are they tolerant? Are there traditions of this in the family? What are the personal religious views of the family or the individual? Um, and also, a lot of it is what sort of stuff is coming from the unseen world that's being experienced. Um, you know, something like having dreams of a new boyfriend coming true 
are less of a problem than seeing a black aura around, say, a best friend a week before he or she dies in a car crash. These kind of things, you know, can affect teenagers very profoundly for either positive or negative effect. And it, a lot of it, you know, you just can't predict literally what's going to happen, you know, pun intended, but it, that's really the case. Families who meet a teenager's experience without ridicule or even saying something like, you know, they might say something like, you know, your great grandmother often saw a ghost too. Why my mother said that one time, yada, yada, or really common here in Ireland is, ah, yes, you have the sight. Just, just accept it, not, not make a big deal out of it. They tend to do better for the blossoming psychic than, oh my God, I'm taking you to church right now. You're seeing demons. This may be, unfortunately, something that happens a lot in my experience, and it's not overly helpful. Nor is, oh my God, we have to take you to the psychiatrist. Neither of these experiences, extreme responses is very helpful if you have a teenager or even a child exhibiting these things. But even with the best support in the world, having the unseen come looking for you when you haven't asked it to visit, thank you very much, can be unsettling. Some teenagers are able to build natural defenses. These are called shields by modern metaphysical practitioners. Now, shielding, which is basically forming a barrier against unwanted psychic or unseen intrusions, is very important. And it's the first step in practicing any sort of metaphysical art or getting in touch with the unseen world. But when it happens as an eternal reaction of a terrified, unguided mind, the results can be to wall off more than the intended target. The fortress that results may cut a young person off from their own emotional feelings as well as their psychic ones. In addition to creativity, spontaneity and other sorts of expression may be compromised. This is another reason that sometimes, but not always, a person might start looking for the unseen and having it suddenly turn the other way around. Their minds have been blocked off by an unpleasant childhood or adolescent memory that just didn't jive with the real world or how they were told the real world was supposed to work. There was just completely, you know, they were experiencing one thing and being told another. And to just to stay sane, they would start, they would adopt, okay, well, everybody around me is telling me this is happening, so it must not be happening. So it sort of appears to stop when really it's just sort of a, a, a black wall, brick wall being put there. Just like the body of a person freezing to death will cut off blood flow to a limb in order to preserve their vital organs, the mind of an untrained young person may just turn off everything in order to keep out that which is so out of context, it just threatens their ability to cope with everyday life. This can happen to older people as well, but the total blocking of psychic per perception more often occurs in the young, particularly the very young. One very safe way to get in touch with this, if you suspect this may have happened to you or someone you love, is via arts and crafts and other forms of creativity like music that touch on that part of the being, but without a direct lever into something more serious. So, you know, you start getting in touch with yourself and through creative expression, and you may find that things start beginning to come back in a very safe and a very controlled and a very positive manner. Now, tribal and traditional societies tend to avoid this problem or try to avoid the problem of the blocking off by having shamans, priests, or other targeted adults whose part-time job it is to watch young people and children for any signs of unusual talents. Not to mention that most tribal adult initiations for both men and women include a sort of basic ancestors, spirits, dreams, and how to deal with them 101 for everyone in the tribe. Unfortunately, most Western young people don't get any of this sort of education in junior high school, which can result in either the person themselves nor anyone around them having a clue what's going on. And movies aside, Everyone knows what happens to people who hear the little voices when they're here. A side note here, late adolescence is also the age when true schizophrenia, which is a mental illness, is likely to occur. The early symptoms can be similar to the sudden invasions of the unseen. Since the thing a young person who really is 
being sought out by the unseen most fears is being thought to be crazy in most cases, this can be difficult for a concerned friend or family member to evaluate. About all you can do if a teenager comes to you is give advice and see what happens. Just, just kind of watch. When in doubt, try to find an open-minded medical person, a young young psychologist or psychiatrist is a good start, who will deal with real diagnosis but not jump to conclusions either. A real medical problem may need real medication, but giving unneeded medication to an otherwise healthy person experiencing the unseen can just mask the symptoms or make things worse in the long run. Hopefully in the future, traditional and non-traditional practitioners will work together rather than across purposes, which is most of what we see now. Because in many traditional societies, you might ask the spirits to heal a broken arm, but you probably need to go ahead and set the bone to help it along. When the shaman will heal with both traditional medical herbs and with spells, prayers, and chants together with each aspect thought to be equally important. We're not there now, although my husband, the med student, tells me that many medical schools and, and are, are, are looking more favorably on this kind of joint treatment. It doesn't seem to matter whether the Western-trained doctor actually believes it or not. The important thing is that the patient feels that they're getting the spiritual help as well as the physical help that they need. So what you want to see here is kind of more of a blending of the two. But we're not there yet. In any case, the unseen may come looking for adults at any age. This isn't just a problem for teenagers. Remember, not everyone has remembered a not unusual childhood or adolescence. What I think of is sudden adult onset of large amount of psychic insights or healing ability may occur following a period of high physical or emotional stress. Traditionally, things that you hear in a lot of stories are a near-fatal accident or illness are very common. So is a period of depression after a, a sudden difficult life event like a death of a loved one or a divorce. You see this pattern even in well-known biographies of famous people such as the Catholic Saint St. Saint Francis who I mentioned before. St. Francis of Assisi was a normal young rich man. He goes off to war. He gets seriously ill. He nearly dies. Then he wakes up and starts healing people and talking to animals. His family is not amused. This is an extreme case, and we have many centuries of legends between us and the historical reality of St. Francis' life, but it demonstrates a known pattern. You know, he's eventually kicked out of his home where he leaves. He becomes this sort of wandering holy man and does all of these, you know, incredible things and eventually forms an order of monks and nuns, and that's who we, what we know about him today. Whenever an adult comes to me with no previous history of being bothered by the unseen at all, I always ask them what's been happening in their lives in the past one to three years, just to see, though, if there's some obvious trigger to it like this. But most of the time, untrained people in this category, they just learn to keep quiet and try to get on with their lives as best they can. They may feel drawn to places or individuals they hope can help them sort out and cope with what's happening to them, but this may get mixed results depending on where they live and who they turn to. Now, big cities and urban areas, especially in North America and a lot of places in Europe, have a cornucopia of places to choose from. But if you don't know even where to start looking, you're just as likely to get someone on a personal power trip as a real teacher. People in more rural areas may already have tried their local church or religious institution and unless they are very lucky, they probably haven't got much hope with daily coping, being told to pray, which can be very useful. But it, if it isn't accompanied by some real instructions on how to do it, it may not be that effective with the particular problem. If they get lucky, a person who's looking for help will stumble into some sort of place, religion, or seminar that can really provide some direction. You know something's out there because you've seen, heard, or felt it. Your nights may be full of technical or dreams that aren't always pleasant. Objects may jump off of shelves when you're really mad, or you ask your friends about the man standing behind them, the one that no one else can see, but he looks solid to you. But he take, finds out that he takes after their late Uncle Joe. You have been listening to part one of Cat's Eye on the Future. We'll return to the show 
right after these short messages. Do you have questions? The cards have answers. If you would like a personal reading with Melody, just go to my website, MelodyPsychicReadings.com. That's Melody with an I, PsychicReadings.com, for information, or email me at MelodyReader at gmail.com. Readings are available using Skype, phone, email, or even in person if you are lucky to live in Ireland. Why not find out what special messages the cards have just for you and book a private reading today? We now return to part two of Cat's Eye on the Future. People who have the unseen looking for them may be attracted to individuals and groups for whom, you know, a lot of the things that seem very weird to them may seem like perfectly normal behavior. The thing is, you know, you want to find a group of people who are helpful, who understand what you're going through. And, and for many of them in a new group, or a individual, you know, some of the things you'll, you'll be delighted to find out that there are other people who also see people who no one else can see or have dreams that come true or have other experiences that tend to go on when you, the unseen comes looking for you. And, and you can enjoy uh, getting together with these people and sharing accounts without getting totally emotionally caught up in things. And, and a good group will have like guardian types of people, people who are, who are at home with things and who don't, you know, if things start to fly off a little too far, we'll, you know, get the group back to planning the ritual or making dinner. And if everybody starts remembering their lives back in ancient Rome, we'll pull them back to what's going on this afternoon and the fact that we all have to finish on schedule because people have to get up and go to work in the morning. Too many open people, especially untrained, working together in a group are likely to get sidetracked. This is why where it can be sometimes it can be helpful if you're first learning just to find other people who are also sort of seeking and whom the unseen is looking for and get together with them. You're a lot better off if you can find something a little more established or at least has a few people in it that have been doing this for a while. Because some sidetracks can be relatively fun and harmless. I, I mentioned the remembering your life of all your past lives together in ancient Rome as being a rather classic example, or Atlantis or whatever. And, you know, they're, they're probably relatively harmless. They're kind of a distraction. Um, but some are not. You know, one one friend with a guardian sort of rock type personality told me of a group she worked with for a few months who really believed they had Pegasus the Flying Horse living in the basement. Uh, needing to, the horse need to be fed, watered, etc. Uh, when she went down the stairs, she didn't see him, and she was told then that it was an unseen horse, but it was really there. Either avoiding the occasion of or asking for jokes involving indoor pony detection, depending on one perspective, she just sort of went, oh, okay. Now, this group was made entirely of people who were letting the unseen look for them, except for my friend and not thinking much about what they saw when they got there. My friend played along, and I mean, at first she didn't even realize that people really believed there was a flying horse down there. She thought it was a really big joke, or at least just sort of play acting, that maybe this was all kind of a symbol. Um, other guardians and rocks in her situation might hang around, hoping that one day Pegasus would reveal himself in all his glory. She just kind of, you know, began to gradually realized that these people were caught up in sort of, sort of group, I guess illusion would be the best point, best way of putting it, and, and she just eventually kind of drifted away. However, in this case, it's more likely that at best, someone, what was really going on is somebody in the group may have seen a spirit or something at one time that was actually may have been in from the unseen world, or perhaps they were having a personal vision that needed explaining but it didn't, this is not really a horse that needed hay or oats. I mean, Pegasus may have appeared to them to try to teach them something. And then there is the often forgotten fact that some beings in the unseen world are also reported to have a sense of humor and enjoy playing around with, around with mortals. Think about Loki, you know, in the movies even, is portrayed. Or, you know, he, he lives 
in some respects, and he loves to come to parties. So, you know, there's also that aspect, too. We often don't attribute the fact that not everything on the other side may be there just for our benefit. But like I said, in, in a real sense, in the, in the best possible way of thinking, these, these persons had a vision or something. They misinterpreted it as reality, and it became this sort of group mass thing that they focused on. At worst, now see, this is the potential problem. The group could have been exhibiting a combination of power tripping and manipulation on the part of one or two leaders. In other words, the sort of game playing that could condition people to follow the leader, even if it looks crazy, no matter how insane it seems. And this is when a group crosses a line to what is popularly called cult behavior. I mean, the person doing it that's the cult leader may believe it themselves or they may know fully well that there's no real Pegasus, the flying horse in the basement. The group of flying horse enthusiasts may not have gotten to this point yet in this particular story, but their little circle was all set up to head in that direction if the right buttons had been pushed for them to get there. This example also shows why a healthy group of that seeking to get to know things in the unseen world needs people of both personality types to be stable. It doesn't mean you must work with a complete skeptic that thinks everything is, is just totally nonsense, but it does mean that everyone exploring the unseen world needs to keep asking logical questions like, if invisible Pegasus is eating real food and drinking real water, why doesn't the basement smell like a stable? No one should accept things that seem outlandish or weird just because a group leader or group member or even your guru says so. The strange thing you have just told them may be so, but asking questions about it won't change it. It just strengthens its validity. So, a good red flag to remember is if in questions are discouraged or if you are made to to wonder about, you know, well, how dare you question. That's a red flag when you're looking for someone or a group to help you. Run. Run the other way. Because remember, wherever you start from, whether you start from being someone for whom the unseen comes looking for you, or whether you're looking for the unseen, balance is your first priority. If you've listened to some of my shows before, or if you listen to any of my readings, you know that the card for balance is very important. And I talk about how the energies naturally will try to balance each other when they try to get out of whack. Balance is just as important when exploring the unseen world or anything to do with the metaphysical universe. And it's just as important there as it is in energy or card readings. It doesn't matter if you feel naturally as psychic as a lamppost or fall into trance and see visions every night. The goal for both starting types is a sense of balance or working towards the sense of balance. Too far one way and you shut down being open to creativity and the ability to experience wonder. Too far the other way, and you can wind up writing letters to the Times, expressing the policies of the Atlantean Embassy, of which you are the ambassador. No one living is likely to experience true balance for more than a moment. It's rumored that some great adepts and avatars can do this, but since I've never met one, I can't really say. But I imagine that even for people who are extremely spiritually advanced, it's probably a struggle to maintain complete objectivity and balance at all times and all places. For the rest of us, this balance thing is a goal as a sign both point to. Once we're not really likely to achieve anytime soon, but we need to keep looking for it anyway because that's the foundation of really su any, of succeeding and also of just staying sane. The easy way to get started is to just sort of go over again some of the things I've talked about and decide which basic category you fall into. Most people, like I've said before, are going to recognize themselves in one category or the other. People who listen to this sort of show may be a bit more likely to fall into the second category where the unseen comes looking for you, but I think there are probably more people in the first category who start looking for the unseen in the general population. It doesn't matter, really, though, because both types of people bring great gifts and all have some weaknesses in their journey. It's just you're going to tend to flip more one way or the other. Understanding yourself 
can give you a head start on how to start your balancing act, but only if you can walk the white line. Sometimes you're going to fall off, but if you know to step back, you can recover more quickly before that cosmic cop of karma writes a ticket. Or even explain yourself if you have to contest an unseen court to cope with being in metaphysical jail. I mean, you just really, trying to focus on balance will help you avoid those things. No one avoids them totally, but it will really help. A basic precept of most metaphysical traditions and magical traditions is that of reincarnation, which if you accept it, tends to indicate that we visit this planet because there are lessons yet to be learned. And we some of them we just have to learn several times over. And learning to walk, Meets not always getting it right the first time, but learning gradually to put one foot beside the other until you gain enough balance to stay on your feet is a big part of the process. There's a lot of psychic work that is like that, too. Basic balancing is something we have to learn. to And, and how do we learn to walk this type road? Well, first, we figure out what, like I said, we figure out what sort of unseen person we are and work on developing the strength and noting the weaknesses. The first, the steady as you go rock types, these are your future guardians of circles, keepers of the lore and wisdom. They should continue to read many books and observe the world around you. But you may want to include in that observation an openness to the magical expressions that are there. Even if you don't feel like you're contacting the unseen world directly, you can explore some of the ways it manifests in the world by really seeing and learning to see the natural world. For country people, this is going to come more easily and be easier to do than people who live in cities. In a city, you may have to work on finding the natural world, but it can be done. If you're homebound or disabled, there are even still ways to do this. Plant or have a friend get you a plant, a little flower or a bean pole or something. Spend a few hours just observing your pet companions enter their world, even have your bed placed by a good window and watch the sunshine and the seasons. The idea is to forget yourself for at least a few minutes and enter another world, even if it's the world of that nearby plant or your kitty cat or your puppy. It's a great introduction to the kind of silencing of the mind needed for trance work or meditation. Projecting yourself into the animal world also previews a well-tested shamanic technique that, again, is probably a topic for another show, but it's, it's getting getting into the mindset of another being, and in this case an animal, is a very, very ancient technique to help get us out of ourselves. As I mentioned before, working with arts and crafts, any sort can help accomplish the same thing. Many artists and craftspeople report having feelings where they get so totally caught up in what they're doing that time just seems to melt away. I've had this happen a lot when I'm at the loom or when I'm working with music. It, it's very common. But you don't have to be a professional artist or master craftsperson to do this. Cross-stitching tea towels after work, spending a weekend building shelves can have exactly the same effect, provided it's something you really enjoy. Tasks involving repetitive motion are a bit easier but not required. An art or craft that involves a lot of repetition, repeating the same, like weaving or throwing pottery, themselves lend to a stilling of the mind in much the same way as a repetitive word, sometimes called a mantra, is repeated in some traditional meditation systems. But even more complicated tasks, once mastered, can have a similar effect. Not to mention the self-discipline required to learn these tasks is exactly the sort you'll need to utilize if you want to ex personally experience the unseen world. The late Mahatma Gandhi had all of his close followers learn to spin cotton, not only as a protest against the English importation of cheap goods ruining the native Indian economy, but because it helped them still and focus their minds for a time. He himself is reported to have carried a small draw spindle about everywhere and would spin cotton while waiting for reporters or famous officials to interview him. Sometimes he'd even be spinning while they were waiting to talk to him. Gandhi was a lawyer himself, and I've often wondered how much of his depth of perception came from natural-born talent and how much came from a dogged determination to gain knowledge and perception of what he saw as the divine. I don't know, but it is a good question. Of course, developing a craft or skill is good for everyone, 
more naturally open people may be highly creative and artistic already, but they can also be easily distracted and find it difficult to finish what they start. Um, my mother used to joke that she had a half to finish sweater from every year of my child, of my teenage years. One of my first tasks when I took on getting really truly serious about metaphysical training, like many like happens to many people around their early thirties, was to plan, work, and finish an entire knit sweater. It took me a year to accomplish this, but twenty years and a tra later in a transatlantic move. I still have this sweater in my closet and it's very I'm very it's very important to me because this is a sweater that I finally finished. Plus, I now have a part-time career as a fiber artist as well as being a fully trained priestess. And just as I never finished learning about fibers and how they work together, I never completely finished my priestess training either. But like many naturally created people, I find it difficult to separate crafts from aspects of the craft with a capital C. Even for folks who choose to develop skill because of necessity rather than desire, it can still help develop channels to the unseen world. I've heard that happen to people who've been forced to take up something that is repetitive or repetitively creative, even when they really didn't want to. One reason traditional people sing as they work at repetitive tasks is that it helps the work go faster, but it also focuses the mind and it can bring about a light trance even for people who are really, really just not inclined to it. Now, there are exercises that you can do to learn things like shielding, grounding, centering, and other forms of balance. I'll probably go into those in some of the later shows. But just, just to give you an idea, you know, you need to, to, to make these exercises work. It's important to do them frequently and to do them on a regular basis. It's basically a continuation of this repetitive system that people can use to get in touch with the other world. Again, if you are someone for whom you already are artistic and the unseen is already looking for you, the, it provides the, the art of the craft or the meditation provides the discipline to see something through. For those people who are learning to experience it or trying to become open to it, that recognition helps open it up. That, that's really, I think, a really good place to close here. I think in, in later shows, we'll probably actually maybe do and present a meditation or two or three different examples at different times. But I think basically the things to remember to take away from this show are the unseen world is there. It's probably really more than one place. At least traditionally, most people think of it that way. It is a combination of zones, like everything from the land of the ancestors to that place where we can go and perhaps perceive the future or maybe even experience the past. It's accessed in a number of different ways. A very safe way is dreams, meditation, different and there are many other techniques that we'll talk about another time that may be a little more intentional and they're basically that there are two types of people when it comes to the unseen world there are people for whom the unseen world is just it looks for them it seems to always be there they may have experienced it ever since they were a small child and unless they block it out it never really goes away these are people that we tend to think of as being psychic or having other abilities the other type of person is the person who wants to experience the unseen and goes looking for it. And there are, and this type of person may or may not ever actually experience things themselves, but has the potential to become very wise. And if they do develop some psychic abilities, tend to be, tends to be a lot more thoughtful about it. And because they have to work for it, may and sometimes actually even appreciate it in a different way from the person for whom it comes totally naturally. Neither per type of person should despair because, you know, there's room in the world for all points of view and all types of directions. Neither is better or worse. It's simply you have different sets of challenges depending on what type of person you are. And finally, remember that sometimes people who go looking for the unseen, you may suddenly have a flip where the unseen is looking for you. And that's where what I think the topic of the next topic will show will be developing a certain amount of psychic um, warding, self-defenses, shielding, and guarding is very important. 
And if you're already in the situation already, you can go to my website at MelodyPsychicGreetings.com and there's a couple of examples of free exercises you can do for personal self-protection and personal grounding, which is grounding is also like staying very, staying connected to the world. As we go into the other world, we need to keep the connection to this world strong. So there's an exercise for that as well, as well as warding a house. And I, I think perhaps the next show will be on psychic self-defense. But I think for right now, this is probably enough of an introduction to the unseen world. And we, you know, we, we can look more next time at both how to explore it a little bit more and also a bit how to protect ourselves from things that we don't well, we don't want to have contact because contact isn't always appropriate you don't want to be contacting the other world while you're working with a hot stove or heavy equipment you know you, when you're driving you want to stay focused when you're ready to start experiencing things then there may be times when you want to use techniques that are a catalyst that make that easier to achieve but again it's all part of that balance the most important lesson to take from this week is balance. And that's about all for now. Um, I look forward to continuing this discussion and other topics at a later date. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the unseen world. And I look forward to seeing you next time at Cat's Eye on the Future. You have been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future, the show where we take a look at what's coming up in your world and your future. Join us again next time for another episode of Cat's Eye on the Future.